Ladies and gentlemen, it's here! The RTX 4090, and today we're going to build a brand new Ryzen 7950X 4090 build. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Look! Here it is! The absolutely ginormous RTX 4090! I genuinely have not used this yet, so I have no idea what the performance is going to be like, whether it's going to sound like a jet engine, whether the whole PC is going to melt, but I think it's time to find out. So in this video, we are going to be building the world's fastest gaming PC. We've got that 7950X, the RTX 4090, a whole host of other beautiful components, and as always, we are going to be showing you the full build process from start to finish, everything that's good, everything that's bad, and at the end of the video, we will of course be showing you the full gameplay benchmarks so you know exactly how this thing performs. So please join us for the world's fastest gaming PC build after a short word from this video's sponsor. AlphaSync is the place to get the pre-built system of your dreams. Without any knowledge on how to build a PC, AlphaSync gets you top branded components at all budgets, lovingly put together right here in the UK. Either choose a master crafted AlphaSync specification or design yours from scratch. The choice is entirely up to you. Get your game on today with that link down below. Now, of course, I have to start by talking about this GPU because, I mean, just look at the size of it. This thing is one thick boy. It has been on the pies. Yet we have a tiny little 16-pin connector on the top that you're going to have to use loads of horrible adapters, but more on that a little bit later. But I think the main takeaway is not only that you're going to need a decent power supply, because this is going to take up to 450 watts, more if you're going to overclock it, but physically speaking, you're going to need a bit of a ginormous case to actually better fit this in. If you go for anything that isn't large, you might be a bit out of luck. And that is a very nice and neat segue into the case that we're using for this build. And this is one I've actually used before. It's from Lee and Lee. This is the O11 Dynamic Evo. So it's the next generation. This one's been out for almost a year, I think. And I have to say that this is a remarkable case. The only problem with it is that it is quite large because this is one of those sort of like alternative designs where it's a little bit thicker and chunkier than your standard mid-tower chassis, but that works in your favor because it means you can fit more stuff in this. And of course you can actually fit, how does this come off again? Oh, you got to unscrew it, oh yeah. I mean, that bit is a little bit annoying. But as I was saying, this is one of my favorite cases to build in if you're going for something a bit more high end because it's a really good way of showing off your hardware. Yet the airflow in this is still very good. It's very flexible. You can rotate it round if you want to have the glass on the other side. You can do things like have graphics cards up here and like a vertical GPU orientation, but then not choke it by this bit of glass or you can have it in that orientation, do a bit more of a normal build. It is entirely up to you. It's a very flexible case. I was just thinking to myself, this is a very long segment, maybe this bit has got boring, but the fan had my back and decided to make this video a bit more spicy. But all of the panels just slide off. This is going to get a little bit expensive if you do want to fully populate this with fans, especially down here at the bottom as well, because they don't come with any as standard. The ones I'm using, the runaway fans, were these, the AL120s. They do like a newer version of this that has even more RGB if you want to go down that route. But I love these because they daisy chain together and they're just a lot easier to install. In order to get this build started, we will of course need a motherboard. This is one ASUS ROG have sent out. It's their X670-E. Now, at the time of filming, I'm still undecided as to what the best platform is going to be, whether it's B650, whether it's X670, extreme or non-extreme versions. Because the problem is, these boards can get very expensive, and when you're buying things like PCI Generation 5 support for graphics and SSDs, all of these different features that you're probably not even going to be using at launch, the question becomes, is it actually worth paying extra money for future-proofing? This is pretty much an evolution of the previous generation Strix boards. It is a fair bit heavier than we're used to, because you have a lot more thermal mass on here for diffusing all of the heat from all of the SSDs and things you're going to be using, but it is definitely a nice looking board. It's just, I guess, a little bit safe, but most motherboards are these days. They're either black or white, and white is the most interesting you can get. Where's a red motherboard, like the old ROG ones? Let's pop this aboard our motherboard box and start talking about our Ryzen CPU. So this is the Ryzen 7950X, and this is pretty much the best gaming processor you can get at the time of filming. I think it's fair to say we're all expecting AMD to bring out some 3D cache versions of these Probably not until next year. So make no mistake, if you do want a faster gaming CPU, I think it's coming. Obviously, we've got the Intel launch very soon, so it's going to be interesting to see them head to head. But in terms of core count and sort of performance for all of those cores, I think Ryzen is going to be an excellent choice, especially if you want a mixture of gaming and productivity. Let's take this 16 core CPU out of the box. And once again, we can admire the new quirky design that frankly, some people have said that they don't like because thermal paste might leak all over to your CPU. It's not really gonna make any difference. 
but I suppose it is something to bear in mind. I think it looks cool though. But let's open up our slot in a very similar way to the old Intel boards. I say the old ones, the current ones. Then we can grab our CPU and gently lower it into the slot. There we go, look, look at that. Before you get excited, by the way, no, this is not my new personal rig, I'm sorry. A lot of these components are gonna have to go back. Sad times. AMD already asked for this back. I'm filming a video with it. Guys, chill, chill. I just politely say, no, it's mine forever. <laughs> and then I get a very formal email back saying that's not appropriate. Please, can I have it back? We are also going to need some storage and some RAM. This is a brand new set from Corsair. They've actually sent this out for some sponsored pre-rolls, but of course I am gonna use it in a build like this. There are a few reasons. Firstly, this is DDR5 memory, because of course DDR4 is not supported on AM5 whatsoever. So you're gonna need a kit like this. This is also one of the few sets that actually supports AMD's Expo overclocking. So this is gonna be running at 6,000 megahertz, no XMP in sight. And this just means compatibility to get these full speeds should be better across the Ryzen platform. Platform. That's not to say you can't use XMP, I have done that successfully, it's just in terms of compatibility, AMD with AMD, in theory, should work a little bit better. So let's throw this in, slots 2 and slots 4, but I'm sure you guys know this by now. We'll grab our other 16 gigabyte module for a total of 32, once again running at 6000 megahertz. Oh, what good noise, that is satisfying. Then we will grab our smaller screwdriver and undo the top SSD bay. It does look as if we have some extra thermal mass slash fan heatsink thing on top of this. So it doesn't look as if there's a fan in this. It's just a heat pipe that should take some of the extra heat away from this bottom chamber into the top, which means you have a fanless design, but better SSD cooling. I like that, that is pretty nifty, but you've got to remember these are the sort of things that do add cost to the motherboard, which is why something like this, I need to check actually. Carl, confirm this for me, but I think this is around about 450 pounds for this motherboard for a motherboard. That is a lot, especially when it's not even the top end. This is a Strix, right? But this will do double-sided two terabyte SSDs as well, which is cool. But the one we're using today is only one terabyte in size. It is the Seagate Firecuda 530, which is pretty much my favorite SSD. I mean, that sounds pretty boring. My favorite SSD, I love this one. But in terms of speed, warranty, support, I think Seagate have pretty much got it covered here. Samsung do have their new drive coming out very soon, I believe the 990 that should compete with this. But of course, PCIe Generation 5 SSDs should be launching this month, actually, I believe, October. So if you want to go for super fast storage, there are going to be plenty of options out there. Don't you just hate it when you forgot to plug the camera in so it dies? I am a professional. SSD in the bay then and secure this down. Oh yes, oh yes, I forgot about this. This is amazing. They've added this little release button here that pulls the slot out. So you don't have to get a screwdriver and sort of jam it in there once you wanna take your PC apart. I mean, I know this isn't gonna blow most people's minds, but when you're taking computers apart every week, this is gonna save your bacon. If you're doing it once every three or four years, probably not a big deal. Oh, hello. What's this? I didn't even notice this. We've also got a Wi-Fi adapter, but then another PCI Generation 5 heatsink look. Look at the size of this, because Gen 5 is gonna get hot. But again, this is what you're paying for. Not gonna increase your FPS. Let's proceed to whack our motherboard inside our chassis. See if I can do this standing up or non-professional-like, at least in a way you can hopefully see. Obviously, it just sits in here. Just pretend that I succeeded. This, this bit didn't happen. Um, also forget that I've lost the screws for this case. Let's just pretend it's these ones from PC Tray 2. It's fortunate that pretty much all of the screws are universal, but here we go, look. The start of our rig, the skeleton is complete. It's looking pretty smart. I think the next step is to actually add some fans to this. As I say, it doesn't come with any. I've used these ones before, I can highly recommend them. Definitely from a cable management point of view, one of my least favorite things about RG fans is having like all of these cables that you've got to tidy up the back and it can get really messy. Fortunately with these, they clip together, just like that. So you need less cables before you get started. And then the ones that you do plug in have this little central control box. So it's nice, easy, especially in this case, very easy to get set up and started with. The way that the airflow is gonna work here is pretty straightforward. These fans down here are gonna blow into the graphics card. These are gonna add some fresh air for the CPU cooler that's gonna go at the top. And then hopefully we should have a very fresh and chill PC, bearing in mind we're gonna be drawing a lot of power here. The only thing missing is one extra fan that you could place at the back, but then they wouldn't fit on this controller. Oh, no, this controller only takes four. 
Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I'm being completely silly. Remember, we're daisy chaining them. So this isn't for fans, this is for sets of fans. So here we're just gonna be using one, two. And if you had one at the back, that'd be three. Makes sense. So I believe this bottom bracket just comes out. Yes, fans go on top. Make sure they're blowing upwards though, or that would be very counterproductive. Then you can screw the fans in. And in theory, you don't need to use a stupid amount of screws, but the more you use, the less chance of vibrations there are. So it should look something like this. Not going anywhere, no rattling. Place this in the back and screw that down. We then do exactly the same with the other set of fans. This is the bit where cable management should actually be fairly straightforward because it is two cables for three fans rather than six for three. And we can just feed these all underneath this bottom piece. Spin the whole thing around so you can actually see. Grab the little junction box and then I guess just start plugging them in. The so RGB is one channel, fan speed is the other. There's a few different places this can go. You could potentially stick it up here, that's quite a nice little area. Or what I think is gonna work best is if it can reach, we just park it in one of these hard drive cages sort of out of the way. I've also got some RGB for the case as well, look. You can connect to the same connector, which is cool. I've now plugged all of that in, along with the front panel connections, which is this little block down here at the bottom. We've got USB for the fan controller and then HD audio for the case audio. If you don't want to use the Lee & Lee software, you can sync with your motherboard with this addressable three pin at the top. Up next, we're going to install our power supply. And the reason I'm doing this before the radiator that will sit at the top is while it's not too much of an issue on this build, because there is actually quite a lot of room up here, usually plugging in all those tiny cables and things at the top does get a little bit tricky, especially these power connections up here. So even if it's just the power supply cables, I'd always recommend pre-rooting these, especially if you're using a modular power supply, which we are here today. But the reason I wanted to use this wasn't only because it's a thousand watt PSU, which we are going to need really for a 4090, but because Corsair do already sell one of these, which is our magic do-it-all solution, really, to make this build actually look good, which is a 16-pin adapter. It'll plug straight into this, and you don't have to use the horrible one that comes in the 4090 box, but we will show you that a little bit later, including why you wouldn't want to use it. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to work it out. It looks absolutely horrendous. I'm not too keen on the fact that this cable is very loose, though. That seems a bit odd. Ah, yes, it's actually for those extra two pins on the top here. This is a 600 watt adapter. Interesting. Power supply ready to go. So let's give this another spin and our power supply should very nice and neatly just drop into place here at the back. So this screws into place nice and easily and then all of our cables need to be fed into their respective positions. It's starting to get quite heavy now actually especially in one corner where it's just got that power supply in but not much else this side. We have our CPU connections at the top. Make sure you plug two in this time because this is quite a power hungry CPU. And then for our penultimate part, we can actually proceed to our cooler. And this isn't actually the RGB, but I don't think it's gonna make a huge difference. This is the H150 Elite or the H150i Elite if you wanna be technical. But I have not used this one yet, but what I have used with the 7950X was an air cooler and it did work fine, but these new CPUs tend to target 95 degrees. So the better cooling you have, in theory, the better performance you will get. There is a limit, of course, to everything, but it is actually quite cool that Ryzen almost self overclock themselves as much as they can. So if you do put a better cooler on, in theory, you can get better performance without tweaking anything. But as you can see from its large size, this is a triple 120 rad. Oh, I seem to have got thermal paste everywhere already. I don't know if that was my fault, actually, that one. It's like the cover was missing. Carl, can you action replay to see whether that was my fault or not, please? Calling you have, in theory, the better performance you will get. See, told you it wasn't my fault. Now, despite its larger size, this isn't actually one of the top-end Corsair coolers. You can go for platinum versions and ones that do come with better fans, but I'm gonna be interested to try a more, I mean, definitely not budget, but a more affordable version of this, because these come with their AF fans rather than the MLs, so these will make slightly more noise, and in theory, I guess, slightly inferior cooling performance, but I don't know whether it will matter. Let's find out. Now, this is a step I wouldn't normally recommend, but if you have um, sort of got rid of a lot of the thermal paste, I'm just gonna start again and add some of my own. If you have a better thermal compound, why not use it? 
Installing the radiator at the top should be very straightforward because the bracket also comes out and removes. So let's see if this will fit. I mean, it certainly should do. There we go, just like that. Nice and easy. Cure that into place with two screws. So this will then go over those default AM4 holes and then screw into the back plate, I believe. It is worth bearing in mind that AM4 coolers aren't compatible with AM5 unless they don't need a separate back plate because you can't actually remove these four screw holes on the back plate anymore like you could with AM5. But here, it looks like you just screw these replacements into the existing back plate. Grab our cooler and then it just goes over those holes and secures with these four posts. Very, very straightforward. Not an issue there, at least yet. Oh, oh, now comes the exciting bit. I think we've done absolutely everything to this rig other than install the RTX 4090. And this is gonna prove very, very desired decisive it's gonna prove very decisive because the asking price of this as we know is around about 1700 pounds just under i believe and third party cards will no doubt be even more we'll be testing those from tomorrow by the way so get subscribed so you don't miss that but at a price like that even if the performance is through the roof i want to be very clear i don't think anyone really needs this level of performance whatsoever for creatives or anyone that wants the 24 gigabytes of vram is going to make you money somehow yes it makes sense but purely from a gaming point of view it's not something that is a necessity the marketing might tell you that it can do 8k it can do 4k over 120 fps all of that stuff might be true that does not mean you need it even if you have these super high-end displays because there are alternative ways of going about this but we will be testing this today for science and if the performance really is through the roof i will be recommending this if you really do want to spend an extortionate amount of money but for most of us we can look at this and go this is really cool and that'll be about it because this is such a beefy card i need to remove another slot cover because this is a triple slot and a little bit more card i was about to tell you that i'm all excited about testing dlss 3.0 but this case does seem to have a little bit of an issue which is at the back, there isn't enough room to actually get these sort of like slot fingers in. Carl, analysis. When I tried to plug this in, look, it lines up with the slot, but at the back, you have these metal fingers this side. And the case's oversight is that it doesn't give you that much room. So if you have a slight warp, either to the graphics card or to the case, it's not gonna fit in properly. But then these fingers don't wanna go in the slot. Oh, we've done it, we've done it. Hooray! Is that in? Hooray! It's just a bit tight. Some people like that. I personally prefer it a little bit loose. I mean, it certainly sticks out, doesn't it? This is the largest graphics card I've ever used. But when we plug this in with our little 16 pin, like so, we should have our rig basically complete. And in terms of cable management, as you can see, very, very easy. And we haven't even put the finishing touch on, which is this little cable management slash SSD bar. Just sits on the top like that. Covers everything up neatly with one screw. So we get this thing turned on and test performance. So let's grab our 4K monitor, keyboard and mouse. Most importantly, our power connection. And then here comes the moment of truth. We haven't got a light on the GPU just yet. The problem you've got to remember as well with the latest gen Ryzen is that it does this memory training and memory testing, which a lot of people were defending in the comments saying, it doesn't matter, it's fine, it's good. But the fact that it takes up to like one to three minutes to do the first time you turn your PC on isn't particularly consumer friendly. I know this will be reduced over time as more and more BIOS updates come out, but it is a bit of a pain in the bum. That's a pretty cool looking cooler actually. I really like that. It does go with the theme because it's dark, but then you've got a, a lure of RGB around. I think the system as a whole looks incredibly tasteful. I think this is very upmarket. I think it looks awesome. And the fact that the fans on the top aren't RGB won't really matter to you because you're not really gonna see them. It's not like the bottom ones or the side ones that are always visible. So here we go. I'm so, so excited to do this. Let's enter the BIOS and enable the Expo memory, which is as simple as it was with XMP. You just hit 
enabled. We set our fans to be silent. Resizable bar is on actually by default, which means we can just save and exit and then hopefully jump into some games. Obviously, if you don't already have a copy of Windows installed, you need to grab it on a USB drive from the website. Very, very simple. Put it on your stick, plug it in the back of your PC, follow the instructions. Bob's your uncle. PC Centric's your gaming uncle too. Oh yeah, I forgot about the memory training. It's doing it again. Hmm. Let's just jump to the gameplay. Ladies and gentlemen, it is alive. We are here. We have Cinebench about to run. Bam, we hit the button. The RAM did work after a BIOS update. It was exactly the same as the last PC I did. If you're buying an X670 E board at launch, please update the BIOS before you can expect all of the memory overclocking to work. But we've got this running at 6,000 megahertz. Our absolute max on the CPU thermals was 96 degrees, which sounds pretty scary to me. We got around about 38,000 on the Cinebench, but crucially, this PC is dead silent now versus the last one that I did that actually made a fair bit of noise. And here we go. This is the first time using the RTX 4090, and this is running 4K DLSS, but absolutely everything turned up. And the reason I wanted to go with Control first is because this is a title that's been available through all of the NVIDIA generations of ray tracing cards. And I remember really not being able to run this very well at all. So I would have to turn some of the ray tracing down to get a proper consistent 60 FPS. And yet here, everything set to max, we are blitzing it. I mean, 110 FPS, the GPU is fully maxed out, so we're not CPU limited in any way. The game looks great. This is running the DLSS at the maximum resolution as well. So it's not like we're rendering it at like performance mode. This would be the quality preset, 1440p into 4K. And you can see there's not a problem running this game whatsoever. And I would also like to point out, even though the GPU is running flat out, there's still basically no noise whatsoever. This is the dream machine. So here we go, the moment of truth. Will we see huge FPS? This is absolute maxed out. So even with ray tracing, something I would not normally turn on for this title, and out of the plane, bearing in mind this is 4K, DLSS set to quality, we're getting over 200 FPS. So that is quite a big difference versus the previous generation. Normally you're looking at around about 130, 140, maybe 150, it depends on the GPU but certainly not 200 frames a second. I think pairing this with the CPU, this is easily giving you the best Call of Duty experience. But then again, this is definitely not the four times maximum performance gain that Nvidia cite on something that uses full ray tracing, DLSS super resolution, frame generation, the works. But there's no doubt that this is a very impressive GPU. It's just a very expensive one. If we drop it down to 1440p though, do we see a gigantic difference? I mean, it is definitely an improvement around about 240 FPS now, but this is not the absolutely gigantic performance gain that you might expect. And this is actually now where we're starting to run into some CPU limitation. I think next gen Intel might have slightly more performance on certain chips, but I think a lot of people are eagerly anticipating the 3D version of Ryzen 7000. So if you grab the next one of those, you can probably get rid of this CPU bottlenecking, but even then you're probably looking at what, like 250, 255 frames a second, $1,600 or 1,700 pounds or whatever it is on a graphics card. I think you wanna be able to play literally anything at stupidly sky high resolutions and refresh rates. And the difference between a 3080, 3090 and this in a lot of the games that you're actually going to play are not going to be massive when it comes to the overall feel. Something like ray tracing, I think a step forward from this generation is perfect. It's just what those games need. But if you're not that interested in those titles, you do have to strongly consider where your money is best spent because while this is going to be a big step forward in certain titles, it's gonna be a moderate one in others and it's not a moderate amount of money to spend. Pressing swiftly on, we have something I've never played or already seen before. It's called Lyra. And this is actually gonna be a very good example for multiplayer titles actually, because this almost replicates like Unreal Tournament. It's that sort of style of game. And at the moment, this is native rendering and we're getting about 72 frames a second. This is fully maxed out in terms of our GPU, so no CPU bottlenecking there. But if we press Alt and 1, we can enable DLSS. And with frame generation and good old DLSS super resolution, our frame rate has immediately gone to 180. So this is very clearly showing you that the tech does work. But if we press Alt and 3, we can turn the frame generation off and our latency has gone 
from 52 to 16, 17 milliseconds. So I think the higher the frame rate you already have, the bigger the potential penalty is gonna to be to latency. How does it compare to DLSS off completely? Well, that's our question answered. We've now gone up to 60 milliseconds latency. So this is the highest we've seen so far. We can cycle reflex on and off, reflex plus boost. That actually makes quite a big difference. Look, that's gone down to 32, 35 milliseconds of latency now. Frame generation off, reflex off, just super resolution and our latency is around about 32. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how all of the different tech numbers work. Best bet is gonna be DLSS with super resolution enabled, but frame generation off, but for overall smoothness and the way that the game feels, especially if you're playing something like Spider-Man with a controller, you're gonna want everything turned on. But for the super competitive multiplayer where you've got a sky high frame rate as it is, then DLSS, 3.0 frame generation probably isn't the tool you're going to want to use. But I think it's time for the real test. Some Cyberpunk 2077. This was the big demo and everything is riding on this. What you're seeing right now is Cyberpunk running full everything, absolute max settings, with no DLSS whatsoever. So our native renderer is doing everything it can and we're getting around about 33 frames a second in this very heavy scene. This is the opening of the game. Ray tracing is set to psycho. Everything is going nuts. And let's be honest, this is not a uh, particularly playable frame rate. Brilliant for screenshots, but not really um, what we want. Again, I think this is probably one of the most demanding scenes in the game, but still not ideal. But if we turn DLSS on, we turn frame generation off just for now, and we'll leave DLSS at auto, and this is the old fashioned way of doing it, but it has been refined now. Absolutely massive difference. You can see we're getting 87 frames a second, 87 from 33, so about triple our FPS. But here's the kicker. Here's the thing we've been waiting for. This is make or break, really, for the 4090. DLSS 3.0 frame generation. Our latency at the moment is about 30 milliseconds. You can only see this on DLSS 3.0 titles at the moment. But we'll turn frame generation on, and what is the frame rate going to jump to? 133 frames a second. I, I can't believe Cyberpunk is that smooth. I've never felt or seen it like this before. It's almost like it's a completely different game. For me, this was the thing I was really waiting for because I wanted to see it to believe it. Can I notice that some of these frames aren't what they seem? Can I notice much difference in terms of latency? Well, no, because I haven't ever had Cyberpunk be this fast in the first place. It's always run for me at around about 70 frames a second max with ray tracing enabled, and that was at 1440p balance with some of the ray tracing settings turned off. So that is absolutely phenomenal. If this isn't gonna make you wanna play Cyberpunk again, I don't know what will. I mean, how does it differ if we actually change the DLSS? Because some people aren't gonna wanna leave it on auto. Let's go over to super resolution and we'll set this to quality. So this is absolute maximum DLSS, well, quality. And our frame rate is still 100 frames a second. So this is 1440p upscaled now to 4K. Frame generation, 100 FPS. And our latency is what? Around about 45 milliseconds of latency. It doesn't matter what you think of the 4090, of the price, anything, you can't argue that is super impressive. And just out of interest, let's try one final title. This is Far Cry 6, and this is currently running at absolute max settings, FSR set to quality mode. So this is ultra, this is full ray tracing at 4K. And interestingly, this is yet another title that is actually starting to see some CPU bottlenecking. That's how good this GPU is, if you like. We're currently getting around about 120 FPS, but I'd argue this is probably one of those titles that does need DLSS frame generation, because it really would allow you to get an even higher frame rate. It bypasses the CPU, it adds those extra frames in. But I'm almost a little bit stumped here. I don't know what else to say. I just didn't really expect to see this. At 4K, we're now starting to see CPU bottlenecking. I'm both impressed and a little bit dismayed at the same time. I mean, don't get me wrong, 120 FPS at 4K resolution is pretty much more than anyone needs, especially if you've got variable refresh rate to get rid of some of those dips. But when you're asking for $1,600 for a graphics card and you're gonna run into CPU bottlenecking issues, even with the best CPU you can buy at the moment, that is definitely something that does require strong consideration. 
Right, that was definitely a lot of information to process. You've seen the benchmarks, but where does this leave us? Is this a GPU you should actually be considering? Well, let's start with the good. I absolutely love the design and the way that it is ridiculously quiet. I think it looks the business. It's the best Founders Edition that they've made so far. I wouldn't recommend going for one of the third party ones unless you had to, because if they are more expensive, I don't really know what more you need because this is really quiet as it is. Spend that money on a case like this that has fans underneath and you're not going to need any more. In terms of the raw performance of the GPU, well, it's very impressive with the brand new tech and it is very impressive in titles like Cyberpunk, in Flight Simulator, anything that takes advantage of DLSS 3.0, you're going to be using this card properly and it's gonna be great for that. But if you play titles like Warzone and other multiplayer things, not only are you gonna need an obscene monitor to actually see and feel all of those extra frames but you run the risk of being CPU bottlenecked. So I think it's fair to say I'm feeling a little bit melancholy here because I can't overly fault the product it is just the price. Paying this amount of money for a graphics card is only going to make sense if you've got that amount of money it's your main hobby, you use it for work, and you're going to be able to get the full potential out of this card. And at the moment, I don't think there's going to be that many people that fall into the category. I'm honestly more excited now for the 4080s because I I don't think the performance is going to be crazily different, especially if you're seeing GPU or I should say CPU bottlenecking. The 4080 actually makes a little bit more sense. Join me for the full review of that when it comes out. Join me for the full review and final verdict on the 4090 tomorrow when I compare this with all of the other third party cards as well. Let me know your thoughts on the RTX 4090. Do you think this has lived up to the hype or were you expecting a little bit more? Let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. But absolutely smash the like button if you've enjoyed this video. As I say, get yourself subscribed. And as always, if you do want to check out current pricing on anything in this rig, you can find it linked down below with my Amazon affiliate links. And while you're down there, be sure to check out AlphaSync. AlphaSync brings you a worry-free PC gaming experience with a huge range of custom-built gaming PCs. With a 4.8 rating on Trustpilot and free next-day delivery available on selected builds, why not let AlphaSync take all of the stress out of PC gaming? Get started today with the link down below. But thank you so much for checking out this video. I'll catch you in the next one.